Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I'm so happy that about our guest today that I have with us today. Her name is Susanna Almanza from Austin, Texas. Hello, Susanna. Hello, everybody. I am so looking forward to our conversation. But first, for those of you who might not know Ms. Almanza, let me tell you a little bit about her before we start. Susanna Almanza is a nationally recognized environmental justice leader who was recently appointed to a federal environmental justice advisory council. She is affiliated with a group called PODER, P-O-D-E-R, People Organized in Defense of Earth and Her Resources. In the 1990s, Susanna kicked in, a, in the 90s, Susanna kicked an Exxon Mobil tank farm out of their residential community, and she also was involved in clearing out a toxic recycling plant and shutting down a dangerous power plant. That is all incredible stuff. Again, Susanna, welcome. Thank you for having me. You're so welcome. Now, um, before we start on this incredible work that you've done, and that brought you to here to us today. There's something very interesting that I wanted to chat about uh, before we started. I found out during my research uh, about you that you twice recently ran against your brother in the East Austin City Council race. Yes in 2014 and in 2018 and and these were big deals because both times you succeeded in making it to the runoff yes yes i and did so well this is not something you see every day right. running against your flesh and blood for right. a seat on a city council um, I've been very involved in city council races myself, uh, not personally running, but working with people running. It is a big, big deal. So tell us a little bit about that. This is fascinating. It's very fascinating. Well, uh, at the beginning, I have to say that we finally got the single member districts in 2012, which we didn't have. So when I was running in 2014, 2015, I actually had, I announced in January and it wasn't until probably uh, May or June when my brother then decided to get into the race. So a lot of people have a mis uh, misunderstanding as if I was competing against my brother because a woman always gets, you know, the bad end of the story. But actually it was my brother who competed against me. And then what happened was um, I actually had 11 men running against me in that race, which is very important for people to know. No other woman was running in that race, but 11 men. And I was the sole woman running in that race. So you can say that it was 11 men that I had to beat out in, in order to get into uh, the runoff. Which is and so in and of itself a, a, a success yeah. all by itself. Absolutely. Uh, by itself, I felt like, wow. And, and, you know, I went and talked to these lot of these men because they never had been involved in the community or, you know, taking any kind of action. And I asked, look, uh, would you support me? And, and would you mind stepping down? Because I really have all these issues to address in the community. And I've been a long-term organizer. And would you consider uh, stepping down and supporting me? And? and of course, they said no. As a matter of fact, I could probably write a book of how bad I was treated during the race. You, you should have. And I've mm -hmm. published a book, of course, and I'll help you. So you have oh. now got a partner girl and I am proud to know you because you've, you've got <laughs> your story. Now you just need to tell it. So, That's right. So, yeah, um, so. That, so that now you've got two stories to tell. But now we're going to move on to uh, the uh, your work uh, that I, that I've already touched on earlier today. Um, mm -hmm. the, the folks listening to this podcast have big guys in their own neighborhoods and are looking to us for some guidance, some some tips, and some inspiration. So, so right. what can you share with us today, Susanna, about the work that you have done? Absolutely. You know, um, through our organizing and for that, we took on the six major oil giants in the whole world oil giants, you know, some people might know some of these characters, mobiles, Chevron, Citco, Texaco, Gulf mobile states. And so all of these uh, tanks were in one particular area that uh, around it was nothing but communities, low income in communities of color. We then took on BF5 was the second waste 
uh, largest waste management system in the whole world also. Uh, and so uh, the tank farm, like everybody knows the oil industry is very powerful and very rich. So what we did in both of those instances and BFI, now BFI was a recycling facility uh, that actually was sponsored by the city of Austin, but it was bringing over 350,000 recyclables into our community. So people have to remember when they put out those buckets of recyclable, whether it's glass, can, newspapers, all of this, uh, was coming into our community and it was, uh, uh, forming uh, like a mini landfill there and causing a lot of problems because what people don't know is that when newspapers and papers get wet they let out of order and it's awful to be smelling this odor in the community but also we got an infestation of rats and roaches because you have all these recyclable things coming into your community and of course they're going to attract rodents and insects and so even the health department had to come in and issue rat poison to everybody in, in the gardens neighborhood and we say well that's not the answer because if you have pets and little children you don't want poison the same thing with the oil giants you know they had these berms that went and spilled over into communities they were killing the trees the kids would play in the water and they would break out in sores people would garden and they would break out in, in sores and then we had the holly power plant which the holly power plant was the largest stationary source of noxic emissions uh, that you know impact the ozone, but it also had particular matter. HUD said the noise that came from the power plant exceeded the standards. The electric and magnetic fields exceeded standards that people should be exposed to. And again, all of these facilities were in low income and communities of color. And so as we organized, we created block captains. We said the most important thing is to find uh, several people in different blocks. So they will be the persons that help distribute flyers. They're the persons to help call their neighbors about a meeting or an action. And then we help form neighborhood associations because the city of Austin is neighborhood driven. So you have to register your neighborhood in order to get a notice about zoning or, or if this road's gonna close, any kind of investment that's coming your way. So a lot of people uh, in East Austin and community of colors didn't know about the process. So we helped those people form uh, their neighborhood association. They were autonomous, they lacked, elected their own representatives and then they signed up with the city of Austin. And so, and then it was having um, workshops. So it was breaking down the chemicals that or the emissions that were coming out from these different facilities and how do they impact your health? And from that, we developed a health survey, right? But we had to break these down so people would understand, well, if you're exposed to this chemical, you're most likely to get a headache. If you're exposed to this chemical, you're most likely you know, to have rashes or nerve problems, whatever the chemical was in the exposure. So a lot of research had to take place. But once we got that was developing that health survey and not an epidemiology survey, but just a basic survey about you know, do you have problem hearing? That would be a, a, one of the questions who people who lived around the Holly power plant because the noise was exceeding HUD levels. So you wanted to correlate it that with that, you know, and in the um, in the tank farm area, we we know we ask questions as you know, anybody have uh, cancers, any type of cancers, you know, headaches, rashes, nose. What bleeds. exactly, excuse me, um, for our listeners, including myself, what is a tank farm? Yes, a tank farm is a storage facility where these big tanks, they store all the oil and those big trucks that deliver the oil to the gas stations that you see sometimes, that's where they go and, and they load up all the gasoline products into those vehicles and then they go to the different stations. So you can imagine uh, each corporation, the other thing was each corporation was being uh, permitted by the state as if there was only one single corporation there. But in reality, there were six corporations all next to each other next to each other. So you can imagine you're allowed to be, um, you know, have so many parts per million exposure on humans. But what you don't have is 
six corporations all exposing you to chemicals, you know, an emission. So the state was regulating and permitting each a corporation as if they were the only ones that existed there. So there was multiple issues and concerns about one is how the state does permitting and doesn't really look at what's already there in the community, right? So all of these things we needed to address at the local level, at the grassroots level, at the city level, and then at the state level. So I always tell people, okay, organize your community, educate your community, uh, put together block captains, you know, you have to do your research and then you have to have uh, activism, whether it's a protest, it's the press conference, uh, it's going to the different city, county and state because we did have to go to the Texas Water Commission, the Texas Air, Con Board, uh, Air Control Board, all these entities to talk about the issues. So we say never, never leave anything untouched. If the health department has a, a finger in this issue, which was the other one, you need to address the health department. As a matter of fact, with, with the tank farm, we went all the way to the top, the agency, the ASTDR, the Agency for Toxic Disease and Registry, that's at the national level. And we say, here, there's a crisis. So then we had the, the federal agency go down to the state and say, hey, state, we got this complaint. This is something you need to address. And then the state says, hey, health department local, here's a complaint, you've got to address it. But now you're letting everybody know from the federal, you know, to the state, to the local, local level, level. Now I'll know what the issues and the concerns are. And that's what I mean about if somebody has a little section of um, bureaucracy and what that particular case, go for it. Don't just say, well, it's all just about zoning. No, it's about health, you know, and it's about, well, what role does the federal government play in this? What role does the state government play in this? And what role does the county play in it and the city play in it? So you have to address all these, but we found that one of the most, the best tools and the most effective tools for organizing was the health survey. Because people don't understand so many parts per million, so many parts are in the air. That's kind of abstract. But when you talk about health, everybody understands health. They understand when their kids are sick, when the elders are sick, you know, all of these things are real, they're tangible. So health, as we did the health survey, it became real to the people. Oh, I didn't know that's why I was experiencing all these headaches and rashes and nose and my kids nosebleed. Oh, it's all of these emissions. It's really real. Well, I didn't realize that this cancer was related to this exposure, right? So it's like health is a real issue. And then when you're able to buy, bring these findings to the forefront, it's a very powerful tool because it's hard to deny the tool, even though they all try, they did try to, deny uh, the health issues, uh, the corporations came in and says, oh, it's because low-income communities of color, they eat too many fats and they smoke too much and they drink, you know, so they, you know, oh, we're trying fault. to say it with them. Yes, it's like, they're the reason spot, but no, health is the number one organizing tool. We use health uh, for also the Holly Street power plant that was also, you know, admitting you know, where there was noise, electromagnetic fields, particular matter. Uh, and that became really real for the people. And then being able to then have a press conference and talk about that data, the, the findings that you had, and who was going to address these issues, especially these health impacts in the community. And that's been one of the most successful organizing tool, not only because you get to know your community better, you go to door to door and you're talking to people and it becomes very real to them. And the first thing that they do is uh, one, they get informed, two, they get angry, and then three, they're organized. <laughs> and so that's real important uh, in reaching out to the community and using uh, all these different organizing tools. This is wonderful. Um, the, and, and I've always believed myself that anger is a good motivator. Yes. There's nothing wrong with letting anger be a motivator. And, and I, I have actually had my opponents tell me, oh, you know, anger is not a good way to motivate people. And I, even though I was a newbie and a novice at the time, 
yeah. thought to myself that why not? That sounds like a good yeah. motivator to me. And it's uh, very and, good motivator. <laughs> and I can't not help you how much I can identify with. Uh, and I, I, I'm not going to talk about me and my experience this whole episode, I promise you. Yeah. But that last thing you said about the when the oil company tried to blame the residents for having poor yes. health because they smoke and they don't know how to take care of themselves. That happened to us in New Orleans after the levees broke. And uh, we, mm -hmm. we were the um, the Army Corps of Engineers went around uh, telling people, well, you know, they're all corrupt down there and uh, yeah. the, and they stole the levy money. And uh, these were the stories that were told and everybody bought it hook, line and sinker. Yeah. Yes, they're all absolutely. corrupt down there in New Orleans. Well, yeah. uh, well, that the, that book, um, excuse me, my book uh, set mm -hmm. that story straight. But uh, so that was just the last thing you said, and I can totally relate to that. So um, I'm going. I have a bunch of questions. If that's okay. Sure. So absolutely great. Well, the last, um, the next to the last thing you mentioned is the power of health and how people understand when their health has been affected. Uh, that they comprehend instantly and and how and I, I think it's a very valuable tool in all these episodes I've done. Uh, no one has ever brought that to my attention. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I really do. Uh, but I understand that when you explain to someone that their health is being affected by this company, by this plant or this tank right. farm that is right nearby, they understand that. And so my my big question is, I, now that we've got come to that conclusion, how how do you go about doing a health survey? That sounds like how can yes. an, a, a citizen of this country do a health survey? Right. And, and it's so easy uh, because what we do is we look at the chemicals and we look at the impact and let's say noise impacts your hearing. So we would say, do you or anyone in the household have hearing problems? Or we say the electric magnetic field. So when you research it, it says it can cause uh, nervousness, you know, loss of sleep, uh, loss, it can cause learning disabilities. So we say, uh, is there anyone in the household that has learning disabilities? There, is there anyone in the household who has trouble sleeping, you know, constantly. So when you relate the questions to your finding of whatever the exposure is, like benzene, benzene is known to be uh, in the oil, known mm -hmm. to be a carcinogen, known to cause cancer. So of course you wanna ask, does anyone in the family have cancer? So when you research all the different um, chemicals that are involved and whether it's the power plant or whether it's the BFI or whether it's a tank farm, you look at, okay, what would be the impacts if you're living near this particular facility, right? And then you ask the questions pertaining to your research. Because if your research is, well, this chemical causes cancer, well, you want to know how many people there have cancer. And so if, if we you, could, uh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and, I, it's a, and it's a really simple one page uh, questionnaire. That was that my, we do. my question, actually. So what are you talking about a piece of paper with questions on it? I mean, yeah. are you talking about survey monkey. No, you mean a good old fashioned survey on a piece of paper. Yes. You just go door to door. Yeah. Go door to door, name, address, how many adults in the family and how many children in the family. So that's so not terribly that. sophisticated. I mean, in a good way. I mean, yeah. it's not like you have to hire a company or a consultant or, yeah. or a health expert to do a health survey. No, you get yeah. a piece of paper and um, <laughs> and maybe Xerox. Yeah. So we're talking something that any citizen of this country could do. Absolutely. A one pager. And then uh, and then we uh, duplex it into Spanish regarding the other language okay. that's predominantly. Good. So we had to translate that and we went with the clipboard. We, you know, did a little script introducing ourselves and what we're what we're trying to find in the community. And we lo and behold, we never got anyone to shut the door on us because people like want to know, like, what am I? Why am I sick or why oh, are my yeah. children sick? Yeah. And how can I make changes in this whole uh, issue? You're not and selling so, something. Yeah. You're, yeah, you're, you are you're giving them something, uh, giving them power. Um, by with this survey. Well, this is so interesting. So, so, so even in this day and age, in 2020, you would recommend the good old fashioned paper 
So absolutely bad. because you're face to face with the people that is a personal key. contact key. personal communication trying to do it through the internet and so forth because people uh, don't realize we still have a digital divide and that not everybody has that and it's it's not it's not humanistic you know when you see someone and you're having a conversation, that's how you begin to develop relationships. And that's the most important part in organizing is relationships, relationships. You need to develop relationships with the community. You need to have those communications and they need to see who they're talking to. You know, this is really, really important. Uh, sometimes people get away from the most important things that we've done all our lives is have that communication in person. And it I is easy it is. to get stuck behind your com iPhone and, and your right. computer. And, 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 and at the end of the day, it's always best when you've gotten out and actually talked, spoken to face-to-face -to -face the members of your community, which is the second reason that this health survey is effective. But I'm still stuck on this health survey. So are you, are you <laughs> telling me, Susanna, yeah. that this, these, these uh, pay, pieces of paper that filled out by hand, uh, yes. that these were e effective enough to get something done? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, it was- So what was you, the next step, Susanna? So you so have your, you, then, then yeah. what did you do? So then after you had the surveys to analyze them and then have a press conference announcing your findings, because to that's the most important one. People said, oh my God, you know, 90% of the people had hearing problems or 10% of the people had cancer. You know, all of these findings will just, you know, blow everybody away because what it does is telling that it's got so many health issues and problems, you know, in that community. And whether you can say it's actually that particular power plant or the old giants causing it, that's that's secondary to, hey, people are sick in this community. And if right. you want to, if you want to make sure it's that, that's another thing, but you need to address the health issue. There's so health so, issues here. So now I, I, I'm with you. And yeah. so you've got, you've, you've done your, your um, survey, which could take a couple of months, but it's worth it because it's so important. So I'm about, I'm about yeah. right. It and really, uh, it, it, it just takes a couple of weeks because week? you've got to be okay. going door to door. Okay. And, you know, you catch everybody on the weekends, the people you don't, you go back on the weekdays in the afternoon because it's a working class community. So uh, you, but you, you get out there and you really, you know, you, you have a teams of people and you're knocking on the door and, and you're so, getting this done. And then within the month, you have analyzed your findings and then you're having a press conference and then you're going to that, those. That entities. was my question. So then what? So then what is that? So you spoke earlier about the trickle down from federal to state to local. And so does your press conference go right to the top, but to yeah. the feds? Okay. No, your press conference goes to everybody you can get to cover it, right? Okay. Uh, okay. And let's say uh, the tank farm, which was one of the biggest, well, that was such a big issue that we had, um, I think CBS and Univision come down to cover the story. So what happened was, and he, here's another thing that, uh, that I have to mention is uh, kind of the media and social media part. You know, at the tank farm, we weren't at the top of like we have now Instagram and all these other things. We were still and in, in limited, but we helped, uh, we had a journalist and a professor help uh, put together a video on the tank farm story. They you put, put it, it on out. YouTube. Yeah, they, well, that YouTube. time they put it out on the New York satellite dish. So okay. YouTube didn't exist yet. <laughs> oh, okay. But, so you, this but, is you, used, but you used the tools that you had at that time. At and, that time. And, and for our yes. listeners, you know, the there's always a tool and whatever is available to you at that time, go ahead and use it. That's and in, right. And in the case so of if, here, if we you can tell the video. visual story so everybody right. can see the tanks, they can see the people living there. They can then hear from the people, you know, they can see uh, what we did too. We did a toxic tour. So that's where we brought in state representatives, county commissioners. We bought in uh, principals and teachers, uh, city council representatives. And then we asked the media to join us on this toxic tour. And then we 
we knew where we we're going to take them on the on the bus. We got a bus, and then we said we're going to stop in Miss Padilla, and she's going to give testimony. We're going to talk at the Riveras. They're going to give testimonies at Mrs. Allen, so that they could see. But most important part is when they got off the bus, they could smell the gasoline, and that was the most important because if you never entered into that community, you wouldn't know what they were having to live on, live mm -hmm. through every day. Smelling, right? smelling yeah. is smelling believing. And <laughs> smelling and seeing and then hearing from the people. Uh, that was part of the media. And I can tell you too, that what happened was we had the big corporations now uh, writing articles and buying ads in our local grassroots newspaper and the African-American and Latinos to try and counter us, right? And even in the radio. Uh, but we had developed relationships with our local grassroots media. And so we said, well, look, whenever they're going to put in a story and an ad, let us put in a counter. Let us put in our story. Let us put it. And that's how we, because we, we didn't want them to stop from getting that money because with the money that really grassroots newspapers get from the corporations could sustain them for half a year because that's big money. But we said, but let us tell our story. So whenever they had a story, we had a story. We and that is critical. To tell. That and is that's critical. very critical to, like you say, at whatever the times you are to be able to use the media. Nowadays, we have a lot better, a lot improved social media. And so we, you have to use the social media for the wider, whether it goes, you know, state, national, and international to hear the story. Because sometimes... Uh, someone is working on a story like that and they go like, wow, we need to cover that story that's happening in that gra grassroots community, right? Right. Uh, and so you have to use uh, all the particular media. But getting back to after we find the findings, we have the press conference, then we took it uh, to the city, the Austin City Council to let her know, here's our finding, here's what's happening uh, in, in the community and so forth. We replied back to the state health department, here's what we were saying is wrong. And actually uh, on the Holly Power Plant, the state health department came in and did their own uh, research and so forth and put together their own report. But this happened said, because of your survey. That's right, it happened right. because of our surveys, our findings, mm -hmm. our press conference, our getting the people. Out. And then I say, never be afraid to take two actions. Don't always do it at boards, oh. commissions, and private. You have to go to the streets mm -hmm. because that is the only way the general population will know that there's a problem, there's an issue, but there's action being held. Right, and it this is where your heart be. is. This is your community. This is where you live. Right. I mean, for the people that own the tank farm and the and the refinery, they punch a clock and they go home. Uh, this isn't their community, and they probably don't even live here. The, the people who, yeah. who own those companies, they don't live here. So, uh, then that is a subject of some other um, episodes that we have. Mm -hmm. But this, but this. Um, the value of this survey, which is when I say simple, I don't mean to be derogatory. I mean, it's no, simple no, no. meaning it's easy. It's yeah. easy and, and accessible it's and, and doable and, and inexpensive. Yes. Um, they just they just need to be put together. So I, I think this is incredibly important. And, uh, and I'd like to um, wrap up just a little. I mean, Susanna, you are incredibly experienced. I can hear it. You know what you're talking about inside out and backward. How did you, how did you start out? I mean, you didn't just one day wake up with all this incredible knowledge that you were just giving us today. So how, well, how I have did a this very start for you? I tell you how it started for me is because I come from a family of 10 and my parents were Spanish speakers. My dad let know a little bit more English than my mom. And so at the age of five, I had pretty much grasp the English language. And so I became the interpreter. So right. I was always going, I mean, all of my life to grown, you know, teenager. And so I was the one always interpreting, but I was always talking to adults. And so I think that whether my parents realize it or not, they were putting me on this path of not to be afraid yeah. to talk to adults. Right. Uh -huh. and, 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 and of course, then I talked to my classmates and my sisters and brothers, but I think being able to talk to authority 
you know, people in power and position and translate to them. And not only that, but learn to edit because I wouldn't know what would set my mom off if she heard something. So I learned oh. to edit my, <laughs> what was also being said because I didn't want my mom to get so up, upset and stuff of, of things that people were saying. But I think that, and then plus living in a very segregated community and living up um, with a lot of the racism, you know, because the color of your skin, the language that you speak, that we lived in poverty, all of these different things, you know, helped me uh, to really be a, an advocate for social justice because I don't think that anyone should be judged or treated differently just because uh, the color of their skin or the language they speak or their income. And How I think early on, agreed. How early on, Susanna? did you realize that that where you lived might have been a sacrifice zone? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I really didn't realize that I think more until I was like uh, eight, nine or 10, because my dad, he was a laborer. And then uh, his bosses would say, you know, deliver certain things to their neighborhood. And that was when I got to cross the highway, which was a digital divide between people of color and more wealthy or white people. And it was a whole new world there, right? And I'm going like, wow, wow, the streets mm -hmm. are paved. So you light. were young. You know, you were I was young. very young. You oh no, young. very, very young. young. And realize it. And because I was growing up at the time where um, my African-American friends were not allowed to go in the theater uh, below. I was, uh, uh, but they weren't. And so I, I got to see very firsthand, like, whoa, what's going on? And actually, uh, they wrapped my, I remember one time they wrapped my hair up and everything and they told me don't say anything and you'll get to go up into the black section of the theater, which I did. And so I got to go up with my bet it was a lot of fun. It was, and, but it was like <laughs> night and day different, yes, you know, yes, and, it is. and I really didn't realize just how cruel people could be just oh, because they, the color of your it, skin. Yeah, and so that's why I said I learned very early on so many things by my parents teaching me how to be, you know, outspoken, you know, talking to uh, grown-ups authority, uh, being with my classmates and my own sisters and brothers, uh, but then living there on that racial divide because across the street from me is where the African-American community began, just physically across the street and it was African-American all the way. And I was at the end, so all the Latino population was heading uh, south uh, there in Austin. So I think all of these things really mm -hmm. uh, help you. guide me on the path to uh, social justice. Um, the, the, the so interesting about the, the language and how the fact that you learned English young, uh, you became the spokesperson for your family and you had to speak with adults. That's really interesting. My, my grandson is being mm -hmm. raised in an English household with a Spanish speaking nanny. Oh, good. <laughs> and who speaks only Spanish to him uh -huh. only. And yeah. so the, the so he is now 15 months and he's not speaking English or Spanish yet. And it's my understanding that children raised in a multilingual household uh, start speaking a little bit later. Mm -hmm. OK. OK. However, mm -hmm. it works out very, very well for them. Um, yes. They're versed in two languages. I'm jealous of my grandson. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would have loved, I, I wish I knew Spanish today. Um, mm -hmm. Well, it is, um, it, I'd like for, uh, to I'll let our listeners know if there's, if they would like to know more about your work and uh, more about your suggestions and advice, how could they find out more about you and your work or perhaps even get in touch with you? Yeah, so they can reach me at poder.austin and that's P-O-D-E-R dot austin a-u-s-t-i-n at gmail.com they can also visit our website poderaustin.org that is our website and so they can find uh, all the information about our programs and projects and issues uh, and also our email is on that particular website Thank you so much. Thank you again, Susanna Almanza, for joining me. And I hope all of you enjoyed this episode. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on all of your favorite platforms. And remember, no matter who you are, you can beat the big guys. Oh, okay. Stay with me.